Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's edition of Pathcast. Today is Tuesday, March 29, 2022. I am Rifat Mandan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal, who is in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome Dr. Feng Fan, who is a clinical professor and director of cytopathology at City of Hope Medical Center in California. And she's very well known in the field of cytopathology and she's the author of the very popular board review book in cytopathology, those of you who have read this book. So today he is, she is going to give a talk on cytopathology and the title of her talk is Thyroid Fine Needle Aspiration Cytology, a review and update. As many of you are aware that this talk is accredited for one CME credit. And I just want to let you know that how you can get the credit. So if you are watching from the United States, then you can text in the code to this phone number. And if you are an international participant, you can email the code to this email that is on the screen. I would like you to take a screenshot of this screen so that you can uh, send the code and the code will be provided towards the end of the talk. And if you have not yet registered, so please have a look at this screen. You can take a screenshot of this so that you know how to register for the CME accreditation from City of Hope. And with that, uh, I would like to pass on the microscope to Dr. Fan. And thank you, Dr. Fan, for joining us today. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Manon, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to uh, talk about a thyroid F F F F F FNA cytology and sort of a review and update and small uh, kind of a practical uh, uh, diagnostic uh, things, and uh, we uh, uh, hopefully it will be helpful. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I have nothing to disclose. Here is a lecture outline. And we all know thyroid nodules are common. Uh, most thyroid nodules are benign. Those are two very uh, two most important things to always remember. Uh, however, in United States, the yearly incidence of thyroid cancer has nearly tripled. So the incidence has gone up. And this is, this is one of the uh, uh, most striking paper at the time. And it was uh, published at uh, New England Journal of Medicine from uh, uh, data from South Korea. You can see that over the years, the incidence of thyroid cancer mostly papillary thyroid cancer has gone up so, so dramatically. However, in the same time, the thyroid cancer mortality remained very, very low. So when this was published and people say that then um, we're overdiagnosing uh, uh, thyroid cancer and all, you know, we're detecting those uh, uh, not non-lethal uh, thyroid cancer because theoretically, if you have increased incidence, you, you know, you might have a associated increased mortality. And uh, so, so maybe we're doing too many in neck ultrasound and we're biopsy too many of those thyroid nodules. And there was even a paper talking about uh, pathologists uh, cutting those uh, thyroids, slice in surgical pathology too thin to detect too many of those small, uh, small lesions. And similar uh, uh, data was uh, uh, later published about in United States, also showing similar things. The mortality remained very low while the incidence uh, uh, has gone up. And, uh, and but uh, this more recent paper actually said uh, there is indeed, uh, in, despite of increase uh, of, the, of the, you know, people think it's an increase of uh, cancer incidence is due to overdiagnosis. And these authors think there is actually true increase in PTC incidence. And they did see a small increase of associated mortality with it. But regardless, and uh, uh, there seems to be a general agreement that we're, we're diagnosing too many of these thyroid cancers. 
So, so, so then that uh, uh, different associations, and this is the first time I, I realized there are so many uh, organizations regulate um, thyroid nodules. And uh, I think American Thyroid Association published their guideline in 2015, sh shortly after those uh, papers were published. And then, then there are different uh, organizations publish their own guidelines. And uh, they, 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 they are more or less similar, but there are differences, uh, small differences in numbers. For example, this 2017 pu published guideline essentially says, you know, if it's a, on ultrasound, it's a tyroid one or two, and FNA is not indicated. If it's mildly suspicious tyroid three, you may um, uh, sample it if the lesion is more than 2.5 centimeter. And if it's moderately suspicious, you know, uh, biopsy it if it's more than 1.5 centimeter, or you know, the, the, the table uh, con continues if it's high risk, you biopsy it if it's greater than one centimeter. Uh, in reality, if people follow this, these guidelines or not, that's a, of course a different um, uh, story. And, but one thing all this association organization agree is that we will use fine needle aspiration as the, the uh, biopsy tool and we'll all use the Bethesda reporting system, which is good. So this was uh, uh, the, 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 the pathologist sort of predicted something like this might happen and uh, published the first um, uh, edition of the, of the reporting system. This really is modeled after the, uh, public, uh, the Bethesda reporting system for the cervical um, cytology. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, it turned in the cytology diagnosis from more of a descriptive thing to a categorical uh, uh, diagnosis. So this, everybody will follow the same category. We use the same criteria. And uh, so it's more uniform and uh, 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 throughout uh, the country uh, or the, the world. Um, so we have six categories, non-diagnostic onset, benign AUS, uh, uh, SFN, SFN, suspicious or malignant. And in 2010, this has a risk of malignancy, which is important uh, for, for these categories. When we make a diagnosis, uh, this is how the clinician explains to the patient. And you can see the management for AUS, repeat FNA, SFN, surgical lobectomy. And uh, you, you can see the risk of malignancy is only, you know, at the most one third. And however, you, you know, two thirds, if they all go to lobectomy, two thirds of them actually will be probably, you know, benign, can still remain benign. So it's a lot of unnecessary surgeries still. Okay. So, and uh, in the meantime, after that, uh, you know, pathology is never boring and things have always changed, been changing and evolving. Um, you know, when we were in residency or even in medical school, we were always taught pap uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma is diagnosed purely based on nuclear features. And, uh, you know, so cytology is the best because we look at the nuclei. And uh, this is one of the papers published and uh, the first time starting to talk about invasion rather than nuclear features correlates with outcome in encapsulated follicular tumors. And, uh, you know, ask for reclassification of so-called encapsulated uh, follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. And this led to this uh, um, seminal paper uh, talking about nomenclature revision of the encapsulated follicular variant of PTC. And uh, so this is one of the longest, probably the diagnostic term of pathology, non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasms with papillary-like nuclear features. And uh, so th it has very strict criteria in, you know, at the time of the publication. So you require really encapsulation. It doesn't have to have capsule, but it needs to have really clear demarcation. And uh, with, it needs to be predominantly follicular growth pattern with less than 1% papillae. And this 1% papillae has been, you know, and then later paper published, actually it's not 1%, you only allow one papillae. And then more paper published saying 1% is okay. So the recent, uh, the 2022 WHO thyroid uh, uh, classification um, put back this less than 1% probably not one. No somoma bodies, 
and uh, less than 30% solid tubercular growth pattern. Nuclear score needs to be two to three. And, uh, you know, again, the nuclear score, a uh, nuclear feature include enlargement, um, nuclear pallor uh, or clearing, uh, intranuclear pseudo inclusions, and irregular nuclear membrane, including, you know, uh, uh, nuclear grooves. No vascular capsular invasion, no necrosis, no high mitotic activity uh, defined as less than three per 10. So this is, you know, to, in order to call it a NIFTP, you do need to follow this strict criteria. And uh, this is the first time even a histology picture made it to New York Times. It's not cancer. Doctors reclassify a thyroid tumor. You can see it's here is this beautiful NIFTP, well circumscribed. And all these cells, if you go on high power, actually have PTC nuclei. And you can imagine when this paper was with this made it to New York Times, we get calls, phone calls. Patients said, I was diagnosed with this benign thing. And personally, I felt I just caught a lesion like this a couple of weeks ago as a follicular variant of PTC. Now this is NIFTP, not the cancer, you know, is moved removed from the diagnostic term. I mean, that is a big deal. So like, what, what are we going to do? Do we go back? Do we change? What, what do we do? So, so the pathology society announced that, no, you know, the diagnosis we made before was based on the best term, you know, practice based on the criteria at that time, our best intention, everything. Moving forward, you know, we will follow this new diagnostic term. So, so that's that then you can imagine this caused a big panic in the cytology world because we've been diagnosing, you know, using these PTCs because we cannot, in cytology, we're not seeing this architecture, you know, this well circumscription and all that. So, so this, the, there is a huge impact of this new lesion on how we diagnose uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma on cytology. And this just said, yeah, we actually have, have our own data showing that a um, lot of things we call suspicious for for malignancy or suspicious for PTC, uh, um, no longer you know is malignant anymore. So it will change the risk of malignancy uh, of these uh, entities. So the international panel essentially asks the Bethesda system because the risk of malign malignancy column is important to, to modify the, uh, the Bethesda reporting system, which led to the second edition. Uh, it's just more, more than just ROM. There are other things being modified. I'll talk a little bit. So, so it led to the second edition of the Bethesda reporting system. And these six categories, diagnostic categories, withheld the, te uh, the test of the time, and it's really reproducible and very nice to follow. So very briefly, oh, so, so yeah, um, so then um, in this new uh, uh, second edition, you can tell that um, the, the red one is as if uh, the NIFTP uh, is still papillary cytocarcinoma. And so it's higher. The risk of malignancy you can imagine is now reduced for these three categories. It's no longer, since NIFTP is no longer uh, carcinoma. So briefly, briefly uh, on each category. So the second edition, uh, uh, you know, for, 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 for the diagnostic term with a slash, really it doesn't mean you, it means different thing. It means your institution should just pick one and use that one consistently. So don't, not causing confusion. So in the second edition, um, people feel this uh, six groups with 10 well visualized follicular cells in each group is still a good adequacy criteria and pre preferably you see this on one slide. Um, so, so we kept it again, this is not evidence based and there's not enough data, but there are people proposed to have less like three groups, but there's not enough data to support to have less and to be adequate. Maybe, you know, that's something for next edition. Again, uh, with exceptions, if you have thyroiditis, you have abundant colloid. And again, in cytology, if we have any atypia, it's not non-diagnostic. The big argument on the, in this category is about cyst only. So, so we've all encountered and that uh, radiographically, if they have a really large, simple ward cyst without a solid component, and the radiologist goes in to drain the cyst fluid, and it's really not much cyst wall for them to aspirate. And we see abundant uh, macrophages, cyst contents, and, 
uh, and but not enough follicular cells. And this is actually truly adequate. Um, but um, the Bethesda system considered not all cytopathologists are aware of the radiology finding at the time of sign out. So they still kept this in non-diagnostic category with you can add in the Bethesda book it says you can add an explanatory note saying this problem may be clinically adequate if radiographically, you know, it's a simple wall cyst and all that. And I have used that in my practice. And because you know this, this is all you can get. And that is the lesion. So benign category and the most common one under, under it is a BFN or benign follicular nodule. And this should be, this is the reason we're doing, uh, we do find needle aspiration of these thyroid nodules because this is, is uh, should be usually six, it should be 60 to 70% of all your thyroid FNA diagnosis. Uh, in other words, this will help uh, prevent surgeries. So this patient just goes back to, to follow up. And uh, if you look at the sample report of the Bethesda book, and it's really very clean and uh, um, simple, benign, consistent with benign follicular nodule, benign BFN, you know, benign follicular nodule. And sometimes if you want, you can put in parenthesis colloid nodule if it's colloid predominant, or if you can put in parenthesis hyperplastic nodule if you see a lot of, you know, cells and not so much colloid. And uh, uh, again, cytology diagnosis has been now switched, not switched, it changed from a more descriptive thing to a categoric thing. So, so it's like in um, pap smear, we diagnose H cell, H hybrid intraepithelial, squamous intraepithelial lesion, that's it. We don't say, oh, there are cells with high NC ratio and da, 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 right? So, so same thing. And we want to keep it sort of clean and to avoid our clinician's report reading fatigue. If you feel obligated, you still want to describe, because we used to be describing these things. We have abundant colloid and she's so, so if you still feel you want to do that, maybe put it in a microscopic description or comment or something so that you keep your reporting part really clean and nice for, for our clinic with you know don't no, not cause any uh, error of, of them reading so so it's the same thing like you know for urine then we know there are reactive urothelial cells that's not a, a diagnosis and for for fluid specimen we know there are reactive mesothelial cells that's not what you know what clinicians are looking for so 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 the BFN that's a, should be most common diagnosis of, of thyroid, and of course we wish all our FNAs are like this. This is your you know if you put a needle this you say colloid the follicular cells will come in monolayer sheets. So so architecturally monolayer sheets evenly spaced new, uh, uh, cells and the nuclei uh, are similar in size to uh, adjacent uh, red blood cells. The chromatin is kind of granular. And uh, um, so these are the benign features of, uh, of uh, BFN. And sometimes you don't have to have abundant colloid called a BFN, it, as long as you have nice uh, benign architecture and the nu uh, nuclear features are benign. And uh, now comes to the dreaded AUS or uh, FLUS. Again, um, the Bethesda system uh, says very clearly that this does not mean different things. It's not like you call it AUS, it's a cytological ticker, you call it FLUS, it's architecture, it's not. And that, that will cause more confusion. And uh, so, so, so if you decide to use AUS, you use AUS throughout your institution, that's easier also for for data collection and for, for studies and all that. So, so don't use this in inter, you know, it, it really is not what the Bethesda system meant. So we use AUS in our practice and it's very important if we want to keep cytopathologists, uh, you know, useful in these uh, thyroid FNAs, we need to avoid overuse of this term. And the Bethesda system set up an upper limit of 10%. And uh, I used to, tell my, used to tell my cytology fellows they are allowed two AUS per week. And that's actually pretty generous because I didn't think we had 20 per week. And so the fellows would always save, save those two AUS for like Thursday or Friday. So Monday, they will not use it. And uh, so the, the, the goal is really just to see, to push you to see if you could actually, because most of AUS are benign. Uh, and the follow-up, we've done a follow-up study of our AUS 
and the majority of them are benign. So, 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 so avoid. Uh, so, if you have a smear which is cellulose, predominantly flat sheets, and have some little micro follicles, that's not AUS. That's BFN. And uh, if you have, you know, mixed follicular cells and oncocyte, uh, oncocytic cells, I think the new um, WHO book will really not uh, to remove HER2 cells from from the terminology and want us to call it oncocytic cells. Um, and some of the HER2 cells or oncocytes might have, you know, some nuclear, some pseudo inclusion type of things. That's not AUS. So, so you look at the big picture, or look at the, the ultrasound and, and all that, and use AUS when you are really, really worried about a, 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 a lesion. And it's truly usually due to compromised specimen. So, so, so in, in my opinion, AUS does not just reflect the the uh, pathologist, uh, you know, in decisiveness, as a lot of times actually reflects the, the bad quality of our specimen. So that's actually can be used as a pre-analytical to educate our, our uh, radiologists and endocrinologists. It's truly, for me, usually it's due to compromised specimen. And uh, you have very low cellularity, but you have micro follicles. You have low, but you have the cells trapped in class tend to have look bigger and tend to passively crowded together. And you know, and so 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 it's truly usually due to compromised specimen. I, 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 I recently at the ASCAP meeting, I met a very a very excellent uh, interventional pathologist. So we have interventional pathologists; they do their own FNAs. And uh, you know he's known to have excellent excellent thyroid specimens. So I asked him what his his secret secret. He's he said small needles, no suction. He uses twenty seven gauge, and that's that's what I was taught when I was used to be a fellow. Small needles, uh, no suction, and don't wait until you see blood in the hub to come out. You just you don't because then it will be too late. You know the thyroid is richly vascular. And so, 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 so again, it's to me, if we diagnose, you know, we try to control AUS rate in our own hands, but a lot of times it's truly reflect the quality of the specimen as well. And for me, when I, every time I diagnose the use AUS, I try to look at, you know, the radiology findings and, you know, see if there's, I can put this actually in another category. And then uh, FN or SFN, and again, uh, uh, I only use SFN, and I can tell you uh, the reasoning later. So, but again, you pick one, you stick with it. There's, they don't meant to mean different things. And you diagnose this mainly because of the architectural feature. And you have micro follicles. And again, this is not evidence-based criteria, but it's been working, you, you know, it has worked out well. Less than 15 cells form an open lumen structure, and the cells are enlarged and crowded and overlap. And the trabecular architecture and the crowded three-dimensional dim architecture. So when you see these three architectures predominant, uh, even if it's not hyper hypercell hypercellularity itself doesn't really mean if it's benign or molecular uh, uh, or neoplastic. You really need these archi architecture features to make this diagnosis. And uh, so, in the second edition, and stated in the book that follicular pattern lesion with nuclear features suggestive PTC may be actually be put in this category with an explanatory note instead of. Previously, if we have nuclear features such as PTC, we would call it suspicious for PTC, or if it's obvious, we'll call it PTC. This is, you know, because of the NIFT P. Uh, so then, uh, suspicious for malignancy and malignant. Uh, so these are all our categories. And uh, so with that, and I'm going to uh, use a couple of cases to uh, continue the discussion. So first case is a 41-year-old female and the thyroid nodule identified. And the low power, you can see that. And I have used these cases before in my other talks. So if you have heard of it, um, sorry. Um, uh, so background, uh, mostly blood, but you see uh, not colloid, but you do see these little small clusters of follicular cells. And uh, you find this perfect microfollicle and less than 15 cells. There is nuclear enlargement and overlap and with a drop of colloid in the middle. And uh, continue looking, there are crowded. This just shows you use the architecture abnormality, crowded groups, 
crowded groups. And there are some nuclear pillars you can see here and there. Uh, and uh, uh, DiffQuick is good for architecture and extracellular material, not the best for nuclear uh, features. But um, yeah, and this, uh, this is another one showing micro follicles crowded. And there are some, in, uh, some nuclear groups but not, you know, the nuclear growth, the elongation of the, of the nuclei. And on the pap stain showing similar things. Nuclei in general is still more round than oval and some enlargement and some pallor of the, of the chromatin and some, some longitudinal growths, micro follicles and similar things. And, uh, and then our diligent uh, uh, cytotech and the fellows find the intranuclear pseudo inclusions and grooves and in longitudinal groups and micro follicular structure. So uh, in you know, the features, scanned colloid, cellular follicular groups, three-dimensional arrangements and micro follicles, round nuclei, finely granular open chromatin and you have rare inclusions of groups. So what is your diagnosis? And we all know now after the second Bethesda, we will call this suspicious for a follicular neoplasm with an explanatory note that this is copied directly from the book. You know, we quoted the book, as long as you quote the book. Although the architecture features suggest a follicular neoplasm, some nuclear features raise the possibility of a follicular variant of PTC or it's recently, I now it's not so recent, so I usually delete the recently described indolent counterpart NIFTA P. Definitive distinction is not possible on cytologic material. So they went and did a lobectomy, and you can see this well circumscribed lesion with a predominantly follicular architecture uh, in the lesion. And there are them, these nuclei just look the same as we saw on the smears. It's mostly round, but have these open chromatin grooves, uh, nuclear pallor. And so this is diagnosed as NIFTA P and the patient does not need additional surgery and treatment. Second case, thyroid nodule, and again showing these micro follicular structures. And this is my best bubblegum colloid. And uh, um, again, small clusters trapped in blood clots, harder to see. Um, better view here, again, micro follicular architecture, elongation of the nuclei, overlap enlargement, and this, maybe there is a little pseudo inclusion right there. Again, similar features on Pepin Nicolaus stain. Let me see my time. Okay, good. Uh, so there is overlap, elongation, and uh, you know, some nuclear pallor, uh, similar things here. So again, what is the diagnosis? And again, don't, you know, there's no reason to call this AUS because, you know, the, the this architecture uh, uh, atypia is right there. So again, we call it a suspicious fo follicular neoplasm and copied off the same note. And the patient went and had a lobectomy and this time it's an infiltrating follicular variant of PTC. You see how the highly infiltrative lesion calcifications, even this power, you can feel some, some uh, open chromatin. And again, this is exactly what we saw in the smears and uh, the features of, of, of PTC. So this is diagnosed as an infiltrative uh, papillary carcinoma follicular variant, and the patient needs completion thyroidectomy and lymph node dissection. So this is different from the first case. And even in the lymph node, the uh, carcinoma maintained uh, their follicular uh, pattern with this deeply eosinophilic uh, uh, colloid. Okay, so, so what do we, did we learn from the, from the first two cases? That uh, one thing is, you know, we need to be prudent now uh, with a follicular patent lesion that has PTC nuclei to avoid unnecessary surgery. And uh, uh, also we learned NIFTP is actually is a surgical disease. We're not able to make that diagnosis on cytology. So in practice, when you diagnose SFN, they sort of has these two morphologic subcategories. This is SFN without nuclear features of PTC. You see all these abundant micro follicles, but the chromatin is granular. There's nu no nuclear pallor or clearing. And uh, so, so this is SFN without nuclear features of PTC. And in histology, you have three possibilities. It may come out as adenomatous nodule or hyperplastic nodule, adenoma 
or carcinoma. And so this is, uh, again, we did a study, follow-up study of our SFN diagnosis, uh, because remember in the first edition, SFN, the management is lobectomy. And the majority actually of, of the surgical follow-up of SFN is anomatous nodule. So that's why, um, you know, anomatoid nodule is a hyperplastic nodule, it's not a true neoplasm. And because of that, I don't use FN, I use, always use SFN. And uh, so, and the follicular, uh, again, in cytology, we're not able to distinguish these three. This needs to be, uh, 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 it's a surgical, a surgical diagnosis. And then, uh, then we have SFN with nuclear features of PTC, as you can see here in these images. And if that goes to surgery, surgery then you are seeing NIFTA-P, and the follicular variant of PTC. And again, um, uh, we're not able to, to make this distinct, distinction on cytology. And uh, so in morphology seem to reach this limit in these categories. So, but overall, you know, this is our six, six diagnostic categories. So overall, the indeterminate category, the AUS, the SFN and SM, uh, really only accounts for 15 to 20% of your overall diagnosis. So this is when the cytopathologists need help. And uh, uh, for, for, for the case one, the reasons I just, I, I show, and I showed. And so, but, but we're, we're, we're very good in diagnosing benign and malignant. So only 15 to 20 percent. Uh, so we, we, you know, uh, we will need a molecular, uh, uh, the help of uh, our molecular pathologists. So, so, so for, for molecular testing, you know, an ideal I, rolling test would be uh, similar to a malignant cytologic diagnosis. So, so if, for example, if if for those suspicious for follicular neoplasm with PTC nuclei, we probably would want to use a you know a, a, a test with a high uh, uh, a, a high uh, a positive predictive value. Uh, in contrast, a rollout test and would have a high negative predictive value in that it's similar to a benign diagnosis. And again, if it's we're diagnosing SFN without nuclear features of PTC, again, I like said most of those will come out as a benign hyperplastic nodule or follicular adenoma. For, so for those, we probably will want to use um, a test with uh, uh, a rollout test. So, so, so we know that commercially available tests, there are a firma, which is initially developed as a rollout test. And then we have the Cygenex, Cyramia, and, and the Cytoseq. And those um, are actually good for both rollout and roll-in. Roll uh, but over the years, they've all modified and they all have, uh, uh, you know, uh, developed, you know, modified their panels and uh, try to, to, to make it better. And there are enough published data to, you know, compare and talk about these molecular tests. And uh, so I'm not really going in to, to, do, to do that. And so this is a good one, uh, recently published, uh, talking about effectiveness of molecular testing in those indeterminate thyroid nodules. Again, remember, it's really not the majority of our thyroid, di thyroid diagnosis. And in this trial, and uh, they actually find that the RNA test, which is a firma, a firma is an RNA-based test, and uh, the cyrogenex, and those are DNA RNA tests. They actually showed it's not significantly different. And the most important thing to remember is that they allow 49% uh, of patients with indeterminate nodules to avoid Diag uh, diagnostic surgery. So this is really good. So 15 to 20% of our diagnosis are indeterminate. And then we send for those for molecular and then half of those will be called benign. And uh, so th then only, you know, half will go on to have diagnostic lobectomy. So, so really, you know, throughout these years, we, you know, the, the, the effort of cytopathology and molecular pathology together really, uh, you know, uh, made a big impact on avoiding unnecessary thyroid surgery, surgeries. At City of Hope, 
and uh, we uh, under the leadership of Dr. Uh, uh, Afghami, uh, Michelle Afghami, she's awesome, and um, and she developed. Uh, we have our own hope seek for thyroid, and this, this is our hope seek FNA uh, panel uh, validated on fine needle aspirate and for thyroid. And, and, and it's, it's a really a, a huge panel includes mutations and fusions and and all that. So 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 you. A lot of places actually don't you don't need to use those commercially available uh, 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 tests, and we, we most of academic centers they actually have their own homebrew tests, which are equally if not better tests. So that's you know uh, up to your own institution's uh, decision. So in general, uh, molecular alterations and these are considered high risk the BRAF V600E, the RAT PTC fusion, ALK fusion, and track And these, uh, uh, you know, if molecular, uh, those indeterminate categories sent for molecular, if these are identified clinic, clinically, they will consider total thyroidectomy. And when these are diagnosed, the BRAF uh, K600E uh, and RAS mutation and all these, and they would still consider lobectomy. So, 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 so these are the, you know, how, how much we know. There are still limitations, of course. And I always say it's not like HPV, cervical cancer, it's pretty simple kind of a direct association. And there are considerable overlap among different morphologic entities. For example, the RAS mutations. And uh, the, you can see them across all benign nodules and, and, um, I'll show you a table. Approximately, also approximately 30% of cancers do not have mutations. And uh, at this point, it's still very expensive. And uh, I, I mentioned earlier, there is uh, the 2022 WHA classification of thyroid neoplasm is being published. It's not out yet, but this paper summarized really well of all the new changes in the, um, the new WHO. And in this paper, and there is this table, and basically, it, as you can see that, for example, NIFTP, an invasive encapsulated follicular variant of PTC, in contrast to the infiltrating follicular variant, this is the invasive encapsulated uh, follicular variant in, in contrast to infiltrating follicular variant. These two share a lot of similarities uh, in their, in their uh, molecular findings you know the ras mutation the the all these uh, sort of uh, intermediate risk uh, molecular findings so so of course with these high risk ones i think we find them that's really really helpful and with this intermediate risk ones or if we don't find any so you always know your limitations it's not um it's not uh, you know we are not quite there yet um so let's see so so remember that first edition of bethesda book i showed it's very simple uh, and uh, uh, you know aus repeat follicular lobectomy in the second edition the blue uh, ones are the new uh, uh, management um, tools so for aus molecular or lobectomy i mean these are all and sfn definitely molecular testing is there and uh, uh, so, so the, the clinician. So here, you know, uh, in our institution, for indeterminate category, we send for molecular testing. And uh, um, again, this is second editions now with the new WHO book uh, on thyroid com coming out, and we now have more and more uh, uh, knowledge about uh, these molecular different molecular tests. And people expect that uh, even in the uh, ASCAP meeting recently, um, expect another edition. I don't think the categories will change, but again, the risk of malignancy we'll see. And I think it's mostly the management and the, well, there'll be more molecular uh, testing. You know, the first edition doesn't even have molecular uh, in it. So it will have more molecular in the, uh, in the uh, if there is a third edition. So stay tuned. So that base essentially is a sort of a general overview of the Bethesda and the things we need to 
know uh, at this point, um, you know, of course, a very brief uh, uh, review, we need to be careful during our practice and know where we are with the molecular and know, you know, the importance of, of cytology in the uh, thyroid uh, diagnosis. So with that, and I think uh, that oh, I will uh, then share two sort of interesting cases because, uh, you know, after all, we all like interesting cases. So, so this is a 30 year old male and uh, uh, left neck mass. And, uh, you know, there is this lesion and this truly is copied off from the radiology uh, report. Hopefully, I don't, we don't have radiologists in the audience. It says differential diagnosis include thyroid malignancy, parathyroid adenoma, cannot exclude benign thyroid nodule. So this is like, yeah. Okay, so this is the FNA. And uh, so low power, and I didn't really see much colloid. I see these sort of loosely groups, maybe microfollicular and... Uh, so um, I'm more of a higher power. I do see microfollicular architecture. There seem to be more variations in the uh, cell size. And uh, you, as you can see here, the so chromatin is, um, is a little fine. You know, it's not like your typical follicular cells. It's kind of fine. Um, so let's see. And this is, uh, again, so sort of a bloody uh, um, smear and a lot of, uh, there are tissue fragments and again, crowded groups, cells, and there's a chromatin and doesn't, you know, we always look at the architecture. When we talk about chromatin, we are, we're looking for PTC type of nuclei. It doesn't, this actually looks very fine. Let me see if, oh yeah, I do have another picture. So this looks very fine. This is a picture to keep in mind because I tell you after this case, we did not diagnose it right, but after that case, we had two and we, we, we got it. Okay, so this, this is, uh, um, is it, uh, it has this abundant wispy cytoplasm and the, the nuclei is round, very smooth nu uh, nuclear membrane. The chromatin is fine, very fine. Looks like the neuroendocrine type of chromatin, right? It's, it have this abundant sort of wispy cytoplasm. So, so at the time we're like, oh, cause it's being medullary. So we, we have, uh, okay, so it's, you know, summary, loosely cohesive, occasional follicular structures around the nuclei, fine granular, wispy cytoplasm, no definite colloid. So we have um, a cell block and it's sort of showing similar things. And so, so again, we were thinking medullary and we did our TTF is negative and thyroglobulin is negative, parathyroid hormone is negative, and the calcitonin is all negative. We do have positive synapto and the chromo. And uh, so, so, you know, because the chromatin look neuroendocrine. So, so we, we asked as a clinician, does a patient have a neuroendocrine tumor elsewhere? Maybe this is a MET because it's TTF negative, thyroglobulin negative, you know, everything negative. The, the clinician said, nope, this is it. So then we say, let's take it out. And so at this point, what is our diagnosis? So since it's TTF negative thyroid balloon, so we, I don't think it's probably not even thyroid. So we made up our own diagnosis. We called it low-grade neuroendocrine tumor, which we're pretty sure that it, that's what it is. And they took out, they did a lobectomy. This is a thyroid. This is a tumor. And... Again, um, 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 you know, those who are really uh, do a lot of surgical pathologists are quick, probably already say, oh, you know, know the diagnosis. This is a higher power view, just showing you that how these cells are exactly what we saw on the smears, have round nuclei, fine chromatin that has this abundant sort of granular wispy cytoplasm and has this very nested pattern of, of, uh, of arrangement. So, so again, for people who do surgical pathology might already know the diagnosis because this is a very char char characteristic zeobolin uh, pattern. So synapto again is positive and S100 is positive on, in this sustentacular cells. So the diagnosis is a paraganglioma. So retrospectively, in the cytology, first of all, we, we you know, for any, every neuroendocrine tumor, 
they deserve a keratin. So we should have done a keratin. And then uh, the paraganglioma would be keratin negative. So that would have been our clue. We did not do a keratin. So, 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 so just remember that. And uh, um, so primary thyroid paraganglioma is rare. And although, as I said, after that case, we actually had a two uh, an additional cases. It's maybe due to uh, the carotid body extending to thyroid. You know, the features are loosely cohesive in sickle cells, round oval, finely granular chromatin, and has this abundant wispy cytoplasm. And is a carotene negative, chromogranny, synaptal, and we know now GATA3 is really a good marker for, for paraganglioma. And the S100 shows positivity in sustentacular cells. Differential diagnosis includes, so this is a good opportunity for me to you know, talk about some other things, parathyroid gland and noma. So it's very difficult to tell parathyroid from thyroid on smears. But if you see a, a couple of parathyroid cases, you'll know parathyroids are in general, the cells are smaller. They form these really tight groups. They have very high NC ratio. They form these very tight groups. And then um, uh, 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 very uniform and smaller. And of course, you have to think of it then to do. Once you think of it, you do stains, it will be you know, pretty easy. And medullary carcinoma, the key words for, for residents and fellows, medullary carcinoma, the key descriptive words are polymorphous. It's not pleomorphic, it's polymorphous, meaning they come in all sizes and shapes, and you can have plasma cytoid cells, spindle-shaped cells, polygonal cells, whatnot. And I have even here uh, amyloid uh, here. Um, so, so, and this medullary is neuroendocrine, so the chromatin will look finely granular. And uh, again, you think of it, and the immunosis will be very helpful, and they are TTF positive. Insular carcinoma, and uh, uh, of course, that should be called poorly differentiated um, thyroid carcinoma. And uh, the, the key cytology features, they actually look monomorphic. It can be singly dispersed and all form, all form this trabecular sort of uh, uh, architecture pattern. You need to see mitosis and necrosis to make this diagnosis, just as uh, uh, you know, in, cytology, uh, in surgical pathology. And this time in the WHO book, I think between poorly differentiated, you know, in search paths, a lot of times we have problem deciding if it's a solid variant of PTC or if it's a poorly differentiated uh, a carcinoma. So in the new WHO, I think they added a category between those two to, uh, to, to, to you know, help with those, with those diagnoses. But again, in cytology, I don't know the impact of that in cytology yet, um, but this is what our criteria in diagnosing um, in insular or poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And uh, there's a review article on thyroid paraganglioma if you are interested. And uh, the lessons learned is be aware of non-follicular thyroid neoplasm that have neuroendocrine features and uh, non-follicular, so including medullary parathyroid and paraganglioma. So those are the three things to remember. You be familiar with their morphology morphologic features and you need cell blocks and you need stains. Okay, let's see. Okay, good. I'll we'll have one more case, then we'll be done. Uh, this is a 60 year old and uh, it's from outside. It's a really a large mass in the inferior pole of the thyroid. And that's a characteristic location of this lesion. And uh, so it's, this is really is a, a poorly, uh, it's, it's not a good sample. Let's just put it that way. But I, you know, I usually try to avoid the, 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 the diagnosis of AUS. So I tried really hard. I spent a lot of time on this case. And uh, so I finally, uh, you know, decided these are, you know, very air dried. I decided that these are lymphocytes. And uh, then I do see, you know, when you see lymphocytes in a thyroid FNA, you think, okay, let's go look for oncocytes, you know, see if it could be uh, lymphocytic thyroiditis. I did not really see hurdle or uh, oncocytes. I mean, they appear to have these large epithelioid cells and, uh, you know, here and there, maybe um, kind of large epithelioid with, with um, uh, kind of a vesicular chromatin and prominent nucleoli intermingled. These are not 
uh, oncocytes intermingled with these lymphocytes. And this is the best of these sort of epithelial, large epithelial cells I can find with this nucleoli, prominent nuclei, vers vesicular chromatin intermingled with lymphocytes. So, so I decided to use the term AUS because uh, truly I, I'm not even sure. And I said the smears are composed of rare atypical large epithelial cells and lymphocytes. I asked for repeat aspiration with samples sent for flow and cell uh, and a cell block because I didn't have a cell block maybe considered if clinically indicated. And then the surgeon says, you know, you don't know what you're doing. I'm going to take it out. Okay, so they took it out. And this is the thyroid and this is the lesion. Very characteristic. You are, if, if you see one next time, you'll recognize it. And it's intermingled with this benign thyroid follicles, this large epithelial groups sort of in a jigsaw puzzle type of pattern intermingled with these lymphocytes. And again, so again, retrospectively, the features are there on the smear, even though it is a poorly preserved specimen, I just did not recognize it. And so, so, so lymphocytes, these large epithelioid cells with vesicular chromatin prominent nucleoli. Okay, again, so what stains do you like to do? We did a keratin, of course, these large cells are positive and TTF, the, the benign thyroids are positive, but these large epithelioid groups are negative. P63 is positive. And uh, is this a squamous cell? So here is the key, the key stain, which is CD5. So CD5 is positive in the epithelial cells and also positive in the background uh, T lymphocytes. So it is positive in the, in the uh, epithelial cells. So the diagnosis is intrathyroid thymic carcinoma. This is the, the, the new term, the previously called castle carcinoma showing thymus-like differentiation. And, but uh, we're supposed to call this intrathyroid thymic carcinoma. And first described, described by a Japanese pathologist. And uh, usually typical feature involves the lower lobes of thyroid. And again, I mentioned that interventional pathologist he said he has seen a lesion. It is usually large and involves the lower lobe of the thyroid. It actually has a favorable prognosis if you identify it early and taken out. And again, the features, I'm sure now we all go back, we can diagnose this. The only problem is we will not, not see, we'll probably never see one again. So, you know, cohesive groups of large epithelial cells with these uh, intermingled lymphocytes. And again, histologic features are these expansile lobules and tumor cells. And again, positive immunostain for CD5 and keratin and negative for thyroglobulin, TTF and calcitonin. And uh, again, there are some published articles on the castle and differential diagnosis, including you know, anaplastic carcinoma, squamous cell. Again, in the new WHO um, thyroid book, squamous cell carcinoma is no longer an entity. It's removed uh, from, from the, from the uh, category it, because you can have squamous cell differentiation in anaplastic carcinoma, medullary carcinoma, even papillary thyroid carcinoma. So it's not a standalone entity anymore. Again, use morphologic features and immunohistochemical stains. So, so don't be so on this, this case, don't be definitively benign or malignant when you are not really sure and when the specimen quantity quality is suboptimal. And hopefully, you know, this with this case, we will be familiar with the cytologic and histologic features of castle. Okay, I think that's the end of my talk. Again, look at the architecture, low power, nucleus and the cytoplasm and pay attention to the background extracellular material. You all you know your diagnostic criteria and uh, the Bethesda thyroid book is really nicely written and uh, um, know your histology well, talk to, uh, you know, look at the radiology, look at the clinical pictures. And uh, I uh, always tell my fellow, when it is benign, call it benign. So, so that's very, very important and um, Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, um, I'll hand this back to Dr. Menon. Thank you so much, Dr. Fenn, for this uh, exciting and very educative talk on uh, thyroid final aspiration cytology. And I'm sure our viewers have uh, 
learned a lot from today's talk. And once again, let me uh, tell our viewers about the, how to get the CME credit for the talk. If you can see my screen now, uh, Dr. Fan, can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so you can send the CME code. If you are from US, you can text the CME code to this phone number, you can take a screenshot. And if you are an international participant, you can email the code to this email address. And I have just shared the CME code on the chat box on both YouTube and Facebook. So you can uh, check your chat box and send the CME code. And those who have joined late, uh, how you can send the CME code, basically you have to register to City of Hope CME account. And this is how you can uh, register to the CME account. And if you have not yet registered, so please uh, check this screenshot, take a screenshot of this and uh, you can register and make sure that the CME code will be active only during the live lecture. So please do not send the CME code if you watch the lecture uh, after it is over. And with that, so I would uh, take a few questions from the audience. So I can see a few questions from the audience, which is there on uh, YouTube and Facebook, Dr. Fan. So one question for you is, how can NIFTP be diagnosed in cytology? Which category of Bethesda should NIFTP belong to? Probably you have answered this, but please you can go ahead and uh, say again. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah, NIFTP is a surgical diagnosis. We're not able to diagnose it on cytology. And uh, it's usually put under the category of suspicious for follicular neoplasm with an explanatory note of some PTC nuclei. And uh, uh, molecular tests may be uh, of help. So. Yeah, thank you. So there was another question about molecular tests uh, that you just, and I think you, again, you have probably addressed it. The question was about how often do you use molecular tests? Like, uh, so do you use uh, uh, Affirma, Tyrosic, et cetera, and what is your experience? So there was a question about that. Okay, yeah. So yeah, again, at uh, City of Hope, we uh, uh, always collect an extra pass for molecular. And when, then if the diagnosis is an indeterminate category, uh, meaning AUS, SFN, or even SM, the clinician will order the molecular test. We have an in-house hope seek for thyroid test. Right, thank you again. So the next question, Dr. Fan, is uh, uh, what's the difference between hyperplastic and adenometroid nodule? Yeah. Okay, so that, that is actually more of a, a histology. And again, in the new WHO book, these are all what we call the benign, I forgot the term, benign nodular, follicular nodular disease. I think that's a new entity in the new WHO uh, thyroid book. And so, so you really don't uh, need to make this distinction. Uh, it's, uh, it's not of actually uh, significance clinically. So, so it's all it's 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 a non neoplastic hyperplastic process essentially. Right. Thank you. So there is another question for you. If there is a hypocellular sample in LBC, that means liquid based cytology, right? So is it possible to perform IEC in LBC sample, or just cell block is recommended to use for that purpose? Correct. And uh, so, so there are places who would use uh, liquid-based, uh, perform immunohistochemical stains in smears and uh, uh, a liquid-based uh, slide, um, but you need to validate those. I know like MD Anderson, Z validated all their immunos on smears. I mean, it's awesome. And, but most other places, including us, we, we do not do that. We only, um, the, our immunostains are only validated on uh, paraffin blocks. But, but it's doable. Um, so I know a lot of places do that. And um, so. Yeah, uh, continuation with cell block. There is another question that, uh, uh, so the uh, participant is thanking you for the excellent talk. And the question is, do you routinely perform cell blocks of thyroid FNA? 
and what cell block method do you use? And uh, he also compliments that your cell blocks look excellent for the paraganglioma case. Oh yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, so, so yes, we do. Uh, so on all our thyroid FNAs and we collect an uh, extra pass for molecular and all the needle, otherwise all the needle rings goes into cell block. And uh, by the way, our in-house uh, hope seek can also be done on paraffin blocks. And the, um, there are published uh, uh, papers on different methods of how to make cell blocks. And we still use the old um, um, plasma thrombin, um, that's the best. And I, actually, I think at City of Hope, we make the best cell blocks. And uh, it's the, the hand, uh, I still need to learn their, 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 their trick. And uh, I, I came from another institution, and, but I think here the cell blocks are just awesome. And uh, it's, I think, like everything else, you'd rely on your uh, text to pay attention to details. And I make, you know, sometimes I make my own cell blocks if I do a late FNAs and all that. I know there are times you, you want to catch every little uh, cell button. So, so, so really appreciate our you know, lab techs to really pay attention to details of all this, try to catch everything. Um, so yeah, we, we just use the old uh, uh, plasma thrombin uh, method. That's great to uh, hear from you, Dr. Fan, and the many of our Cytotech colleagues are watching this lecture and a big shout out to them, to yeah. the, our colleagues in the Cytotech yeah. lab at City of Hope. And there is another question for you. So what will be the diagnosis criteria for MPCT on final aspiration? What is MPCT? Yeah, I am not sure um, what does that mean? I didn't get it. Uh, so I, I mean, we have to move to the next question. So the next question is, which needle is best for thyroid? Uh, I use 22Z and happy with it, but you say 27. Oh yeah, I, I, I would not. So normally you probably use 25 gauge. I think 22 is just way too big. And then uh, for thyroid, you hit, uh, thyroid is richly vascular, you, <clears throat> you hit <clears throat> blood vessels and uh, it, the field start to bleed and then you're just, your needle gets clot, then you are done. So, so, so 27 or 25, and I think most commonly used probably is 25, but again, I talked to the, this interventional pathologist, he says 27, so I would really use 27 probably. The, the small, we always know that the bigger needle doesn't mean more sample, and a small needle can get you a lot of, uh, I personally, I know when, uh, you know, when clinically I suspect a nodular sclerosis in Hodgkin, the 27 needle can go through, you know, through those fibrous bands that get me cells much better than a bigger needle. So we, we say you either truly do a fine needle biopsy or in, uh, you know, in other scenarios, you know, thyroid is too richly vascular, really core is not uh, recommended. And uh, we, you know, the Bethesda system, the criteria is worked out so well for, 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 for that. I, yes, uh, to answer your question, 22 gauge, I think it's, it's too big. Thank you, Dr. Fenn. And uh, personally, I like the word that you have used a couple of times in your talk. It's that uh, being interventional pathologists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that's something probably we might not have thought about it. And I and as we have a lot of our colleagues who have joined from different countries. So, I mean, I'm not sure in how many places that the pathologists do the final aspiration themselves. So, I mean, do you have any suggestion for them about the pathologists doing the uh, aspiration themselves and not uh, letting it to be done by our colleagues in radiology or, or you know, like our colleagues in surgery? So what's your experience and what's your suggestion on that? Correct, I mean, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It really depends on your institution and, uh, uh, and also your workload, right? So cytopathologists in general, we, we love to do fine needle aspirations. And, um, and because we, we, you know, we make the assessment and we know which, where to go and, and all that. But on the other hand, we, our main job is, is 
is a diagnostic to, to look at slides to make diagnosis. So, so unless there is, uh, um, so these interventional pathologists I'm talking about, he actually has a, his own FNA clinic, right? So people refer cases to him and his volume is tremendous. And he does so many thyroids, beautiful smears. And otherwise, in, in our institution, the pathologists are already very busy. So, so I'm happy, you know, we don't need to really take the um, ultrasound guided FNA from our endocrinologist and, 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 and radiologist, uh, as long as they give us good samples. Um, so, so it's truly, I, I don't, I, it's really, um, again, the thyroid nodule can be FNA by pathologist radiologist and endocrinologist and even ENT surgeons. So, so they all can do it. And it's up to your, your, your different scenarios in your situation. Like in a city of hope right now, I, we don't feel the need of us doing, and we don't have the time. And, uh, and uh, I think our uh, clinical colleagues can easily handle those. And so, but you know, if you see a need there are other places the radiologists are so busy and they like to embolize tumors and do all these other things. They don't rather, they rather not do thyroid FNAs, then maybe that's an opportunity that the pathologist can pick, pick on. So I don't really have a strong opinion of you know, us doing those personally, but I have, I have seen really good uh, pathologists uh, like UCSF is a good example. They have their, their FNA clinic is so successful and uh, uh, amazing uh, volume. I think it's 6,000 or something per year. So, or maybe more even. Thank you again. So here is another question on actually uh, on-site evaluation. So what is your experience about uh, on-site evaluation of thyroid aspirations and like, uh, and giving the instant uh, a uh, feedback to your colleagues uh, or, or to the patient, uh, what, what do you do? Yeah, we, we routinely, um, we believe in uh, rapid onsite, uh, it's abbreviated as ROSE. Yeah, we believe uh, ROSE in all these uh, <coughs> uh, FNA procedures. So we provide our, our uh, uh, cytotext go on to these uh, thyroid FNAs and, uh, uh, and tell you know, tell them if it's adequate or we need more passes. So it, it, it's, it's, it's really important uh, to uh, assure we get good samples. And, but again, usually if after four or five, it's get specimen get bloody and there's really no reason to keep going. You know, maybe if they want to do a few more, fine, we'll just rinse them all. And uh, um, usually I, I think after four or five passes that, um, that we, we, we really don't need to keep making smears and all that. Thank but, you. Yeah. Yes, Go ahead. You had something to say? Oh, no, no. Yeah, but, but to answer the question, yes, we routinely uh, perform roles for these FNA procedures. And I understand that you do the GIMSA stain for those. So when do you? Yes, do we do difficult stain and um, worked out well, yeah, for us. So here is the next question for you, Dr. Fan. The question is, uh, do you see a near future where Bethesda thyroid reporting is going to be combined with NGS molecular testing into one system? Uh, I think that probably is coming, yes. And uh, um, I think the, the next one, if there will be a next one, because one time I, I talked to Dr. Um, anyhow, so if uh, the molecular um, will be dominant in the next edition um, in our diagnosis and management and all that, yes, I think it will be uh, what's coming for next edition. All right, thank you again. Uh, this is a question for you that what is an acceptable level of category? I'm not sure uh, if you understand the question. Uh, what, what is the question? What is an acceptable level of category three? Category three, which is AUS. Yeah. So, so again, the Bethesda book, the first edition says uh, less than 7%. And a lot of places find that difficult to, uh, to reach. So the second edition of Bethesda book says 10%. 
and uh, just so 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 10 percent uh, um, which is uh, uh, really a good quality monitor i mean imagine if half of your, of your diagnosis are aus then they might as well send everything to molecular right so 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 but again like i said aus is not does not just reflect the pathologist's ability to to interpret it also reflects the quality of the specimen so yeah but 10 percent that's the answer to your question right so thank you there are some comments about uh, pathologists doing fna and uh, i will read them for you so one of the pathologist colleague is saying that i love doing fna procedure myself it makes my diagnosis very interesting to me and then another colleague is saying that i am doing fna myself the smear making is very important and uh, uh, she is uh, thanking you for this informative talk okay. and uh, La another next question is uh, how can we differentiate NIFT P from papillary carcinoma cytologically? I think you answered it, but maybe you want to say again. Yeah, again, that's a surgical pathology diagnosis. We don't make that distinction. We were not able to make that distinction. Oh, oh, she's asking. Maybe if you are asking about conventional PTC, conventional PTC. So I'm talking about follicular patent lesion. So, so if you have papillary nuclei, if it's a follicular pattern, then we're not able to tell if it's NIFTA P or follicular variant of PTC. But conventional PTC, the, their architecture is not a follicular pattern. It has those large branching uh, groups, papillary structures. Those are conventional PTC. They are not follicular pattern. They are papillary pattern. So that's different. That we are able to diagnose on cytology uh, as PTC. We have we are very very good at that. All right. And here is another question about the technique. Uh, so FNA by capillary suction procedure or aspiration, which is better for cell yield, and which one do you prefer? No suction for thyroid FNA. Yes. In general, you know when you do FNA, the needle tip. It acts like a biopsy tool to cut through the tissue to get the tissue into your needle. So, so even when I do uh, my own, I do my own FNAs. I don't do much suction. It's really the needle tip cut through, and uh, uh, um, so, so, so that's that's just my own uh, own experience. Uh, oh yeah, we are getting back to that uh, abbreviation. So. MPCT was micropapillary carcinoma of thyroid. And uh, the question I will read again. So what will be the diagnostic criteria for micropapillary carcinoma of thyroid by fine needle aspiration? Oh, a micropapillary. Yeah, I don't think I have, have made that diagnosis on, on, on FNA yet. There is such an entity. And uh, um, I, that's a good question. I have not had a case yet. Maybe that maybe that's the one which is less than one centimeter. That's the micropapillary. Oh, it? micro! I thought you. Oh, oh, you mean microcarcinoma? Micro, yeah. I not think. micropapillary. Those are those are called microcarcinoma, not micropapillary. Micropapillary refers to the architecture. It's not papillary. It's micropapillary. I, I think that's what. Right. So there's another question. Uh, what do you do with thyroid FNA with some colloid, abundant small lymphocytes, and no oncocyte at all? Good question. Uh, that's that's the one you can um, uh, again use clinical features. If we, if clinically, you know, there is a history of uh, Hashimoto, or again, we're not supposed to say Hashimoto. We say chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis. You you can actually say these features, you know, are suggestive. Compatible with lymphocytic thyroiditis. Uh, uh, um, I think um, if you feel comfortable, and otherwise, um, you know, you can say you, you know, otherwise the lymphocyte sample maybe it's a lymphocyte sampling from an adjacent lymph node uh, instead of from the thyroid. And so, so if you don't see follicular cells, so there are these two possibilities. So it could still be a lymphocytic thyroiditis, but also could be a sampling of an adjacent uh, lymph node. Um, so, so it depends on your clinical scenario uh, um, to try to make a diagnosis. Again, I would not call that AUS, right? And there is another technical question, Dr. Fan, that many patients develop vasovagal. Uh, how do you handle that? 
like a big, big uh, yeah, 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 I know. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't like that. I have had so, so that's why I, uh, uh, I, when I do FNAs, I usually do it in the clinic. So there are nurses and you know, physicians and around, and you, you know, you have them lay flat and put a cold um, towel or something on the head, and usually they get better very quickly. But the first thing you do is you have them lay flat and uh, you know put a cold towel or paper towel on their forehead and then call a nurse so that's what i do and it does happen so i try to when you do a neck half and it's try to not massage it too much just go go to the lesion right and uh, there are a lot of comments from our pathology colleagues around the world that many of them are doing the uh, fna for thyroid uh, themselves and uh, and it's great very good experience and i, I think uh, it's good to know that uh, maybe in those places where you have not tried doing FNA yourself, so maybe uh, you can consider doing it yourself if that yeah. is. And one another question, Dr. Fan. So if there are diff quick and LBC samples taken, should they be taken by several aspirations or the same half material for diff quick and another for liquid base? How do you do that? Oh, I, 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 that I honestly don't know uh, the difference. We, you know, make our smears, then we rinse our needle. So, 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 so that you have to figure out um, um, that, um, um, yourself. I'm not sure if, you know, half of this for half for that, it might work better. That I do not have experience. Yeah, and uh, one of our colleagues also wants to know what is a better preparation? Is it LBC or is it uh, Div Quick? Oh, uh, yeah. Again, that uh, uh, it's up to your uh, institution. And, uh, and we all heard Dr. Sebas, and uh, he uh, they they do FNA's uh, uh, interpretation on uh, liquid based uh, thin preps. And they are trained. He gave an excellent talk on how to read thyroid uh, FNA on a thin prep slide. And uh, but the general practice is, you know, diff quick, uh, a smear for diff quick, a smear for pap stain, and then rinse the needle uh, for cell block. Uh, I'm, you know, more used to uh, to diff quick uh, to for colloid and architecture and uh, you know amyloid or the extracellular material, but. It's doable if you only, if you don't, there are places don't have people uh, for, for rows and uh, <clears throat> we'll just have the clinician rinse needle or in <clears throat> sight light for thin prep. So that is doable and there are papers published on that. So definitely doable. And um, you just have to train yourself and, uh, and uh, learn. It's a little bit different. Right. One last question, uh, Dr. Fan. So what is your AUS ratio? Uh, one of our colleagues says that my ratio is 22%. So how can I reduce it? Any suggestion? <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent question. So because in PAP uh, smears, we use the ask a seal ratio to control our ask us rate, you know, is a good because uh, it, it also depends on your population. So there are papers published using uh, uh, AUS slash, you know, neoplastic or whatever ratio as a, as a quality uh, control. And uh, not, there are now even uh, more papers talking, which is we may also do the same thing to see your AUS uh, molecular result. Uh, uh, ratio to see uh, to con to see how how and what is a good ratio to have right for 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 pap we know you know two to three to one is a good one to have but for thyroid I think it's still uh, right now Bethesda says says AUS less than ten percent and how can you reduce it again it's not just you it's also your specimen quality and try to incorporate you know radiologic findings you know again if the majority features are benign call it benign. That's the most important thing. And so there will always, you can always find a group with some atypia. Don't base the, your diagnosis on that one group. You do have to see the whole thing, use the whole thing. So. Right. Uh, I think uh, with that, we have come to the end of the Q&A session, Dr. Fan, and thank you again for taking all these uh, questions for our our audience and I'm sure our audience uh, liked your talk a lot and 
before we end, I want to share the uh, screen one more time so that those who want to get the CME credit, so you can actually either text in the CME code to this phone number if you are watching from the United States. And if you are watching from outside of the United States, you can email the CME code to this email address. But before you can do that, you will actually have to register for the City of Hope CME. And this is how you can actually register for the CME if you have not done that. So please take a screenshot of this and so that you can register and send the CME code and make sure that the CME code will be active only during the live lecture. And if you watch the lecture later when it will be archived, so the CME code will not be active. So please do not send the CME code if you have watched the lecture after it is over. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Fan once again for this uh, excellent talk. And, uh, and I'm sure our colleagues have loved this talk and Dr. Fan, you would be happy to know that uh, uh, this lecture was watched live from uh, nearly 300 viewers from across the world. And uh, uh, they have defined time zone and they stayed with us during the talk. And I could see that uh, there were viewers from so many different countries uh, as long as, uh, as far as Nigeria, Romania, Iraq, uh, Panama, United Kingdom, uh, Slovenia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Ecuador, Philippines, Finland, Italy, Libya, Nepal, Peru, I could I could keep track of these countries and thanks to all of our viewers for your support. And uh, if you like our lecture, so please don't uh, forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel that is Patcast. And you can also follow our Facebook page that is also Fat Patcast so that you can stay tuned with all the upcoming lectures. And our website also has all the lectures uh, which are arranged by uh, subspeciality. Our website is pathologycast.com. And our next lecture is actually coming up on April 4th. And that would be a dermatopathology lecture. And we will have a dermatopathologist as well as a dermatologist who would be presenting side by side. And they would be presenting from India. And the topic is uh, infections in dermatology. So they would cover topics like leprosy, tuberculosis, leishmaniasis, and some of the entities that uh, we do not see in some parts of the world, but very prevalent in some parts of the world. So hope you will stay tuned. And the time is seven, uh, sorry, um, 9 a.m. Pacific time in US and uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And that is April 7th. Hope to see you then. And thank you again, Dr. Fan, for this excellent talk. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>